I think we definitely have to bring like health equity into this conversation because yeah. like, and also not over rotate. So interestingly enough, I got a mailer from my health plan the other day and I had just done a survey that did about like ethnicity and race. And of course I bubbled like Asian and then not mm-hmm. Hispanic. Mm-hmm. But what was interesting is that then I got a mailer that was predominantly like, just like, just not just one flavor of Asian, but all Asian, like Korean and Japanese and Chinese all represented. And, you know, the plan sent me that I understand that, but also like, I'm adopted, my parents are white, and I largely identify as being like gay and a veteran over yeah. being like Korean. And so it's uh-huh. like a real over rotation where I was like, well, now you're just kind of like, it's, it's like almost like disingenuous when it's like mm-hmm. done so monolithically and so i think there is a balance where we one offer culturally and linguistically appropriate services and care but also we don't over rotate where then we just kind of lose the plot yeah where you're pushing well, people in boxes they don't belong in and yeah, yeah i don't want to be in that box yeah. i'm happy yeah. in the gay box though yeah no so knowing that di- they don't have a flyer for that though unfortunately <laughs> um but I want so, that. <laughs> knowing demographics is, is not a substitute for knowing preference of the person, right? Ooh. Like those two things should go together such that when you know the preference of the person, you can deliver it in a, in a culturally sort of responsible way. Um, but it's not, it's not a substitute. It's not saying that you know everything about the proper channel, phrasing, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. To really help uh, help a health plan member or beneficiary um, access their care, just because you know that demographic, right? That you still have to know what their sort of personal preferences are and what's actually going to reach and help them. Say it louder for the folks in the back. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how many times I am in conversations where I'm just like, "That's your plan? Like mm-hmm. that's no, that's not knowing your members. That's being able to collect data very efficiently and then just putting everyone into boxes, and we really lose." intersectionality and what makes our members members. Like if you look at Oregon, like you cut Oregon down the cascades on the left side of the cascades where you have like Portland, Salem, Eugene, I'm talking about Oregon cities, everyone. But then on the other side, (laughs) you have very rural areas. It's very different in terms of their beliefs where they could be, you know, English speaking and Caucasian, but they're going to have very fundamental differences in their motivations for their health, how well they feel about their health and also their levels of health literacy. And I think that it's, and I know it's difficult to kind of do that Rubik's cube and it's a hard exercise to have as leaders, but I think it's definitely worth a conversation. I could talk about this for hours with you all as you, our listeners probably could tell. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask you both a question, which I did not tell you I was going to ask you guys. So surprise, conversely, uh, star ratings was interesting this year, but we had the landscape files and the PPP files come out um, before. And so in looking at the data, 7% of the Medicare Advantage market is losing their plan in 2025. So all these plans made investments in star ratings. Maybe your star rating went up. Maybe it went down. And maybe you exited a market and maybe you didn't. And you might be gaining members, which we refer to lovingly sometimes as adverse selection which I don't like the name of that, but we say it all the time, like ER deferment and things like that. We're we're not supposed to say, but sometimes Mm -hmm. we still say them. But what is that going to do as we look forward to like next year? Um, And, you know, the members that are going to be coming to the plan, I did a fun little exercise that I'm almost done with of mapping the uh, markets that exited either by a service area reduction or just by terminating a contract to area deprivation index because I have a strong hypothesis that some plans that are exiting are actually in the areas where members desperately need a Medicare Advantage plan. So what is this going to do to STARS? And we've just been talking a lot about health equity. What are your guys' thoughts on on what we're looking at for next year? (laughs) Nate's face says it all. Listen, people, uh, people are making business decisions about service areas and benefits. Uh, and about, you know, they're they're looking county by county at different profitability metrics and things of that nature. Um, I, and we can understand why they have to do that, um, at, but also go through sort of the thought experiment of what you're doing, Jen, and saying, but what are the downstream consequences of that? What are the variables that aren't making it into that analysis where um, there are needs of specific communities that will it will be even harder for them to meet 
um, because companies feel like they have to make these business decisions. That's not an answer, but I, you know, yeah. Yeah. That's fair. I think like, you know, I'm just like, just like, I don't want to say concern. I don't want to like be like the person that's always like wringing my hands. But I, as we think about like, you know, SNSE that's like currently on display, we think about like, you know, in CMS has indicated that looming cause measure that really ties to SNSE with like, mm -hmm. not only did you get an intervention, but how'd you feel about that intervention? And also right. as we transition into this new reward factor, health equity index, I can't help but thinking, yeah, it, I don't want to say short-sighted, but I want to say like, what is the plan folks? Mm -hmm. What's the plan? Mm -hmm. It's an investment. I don't know if there, I don't know that there's a, a plan, a long-term plan by and large. Don't say that. I like going to bed at night thinking some, there are some people that have the plan and maybe I just haven't seen it. I didn't say nobody has a plan. I just, I said, by and large, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's making it into the calculus yet. Right. Cause that's, oh gosh, that's uh, even though it's already happening, right. That's a year down the road, but um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, we see oh. seven, so right. Seven, seven contracts at five stars. Yeah. Right. So the, the upper end of that distribution kind of like shifting downward, um, there is still a hold harmless provision to bump that up, uh, right, to only plans yeah. that are already at five stars. I mean, you do that now, right, when there's fewer plans than ever in that five star range. Yeah. And then you're knocking the four and a half star plans, you know, down even more and also impacting some of the four star plans, right, to save that QVP revenue. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't broadly sense a plan, a consensus across the industry, consistently across parent organizations to deal with it, even though everybody knows it's happening and it, that it's, that it's coming. I, I don't know if there's a, I didn't put thought to whether someone, I assumed there was a plan. I, I never, it didn't enter my mind that there could not be one. <laughs> so under the assumption that there's a plan, I just was trying to like look through what I saw happening across the nation when these, when the, you know, the ratings data became available to us yesterday and just trying to kind of piece together a little bit in the 10 minutes we've had the data in our hands, what impact might that have on the health equity index, right? So we've got like those seven contracts that perform at the five star level. Weren't like six of them SNPs? Uh, yeah. I don't know the I don't I know the exact so, count, maybe? but yeah, 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 several. So they're yeah. almost we did all see SNP increased in like that's where it's growing this year. I can't yeah. tell you guys how many articles I've seen. Like SNP, SNP, SNP is the way to go. We saw growth in D SNPs a lot. Secondary to that, you know, C SNPs. C -SNPs like maybe yeah. do we? get back to the basics yeah. we see like you know scan differentiating adding a new product line this year specifically for asian americans is it that we need to you know think about the segmentations of our population more thoughtfully yeah and i'm just I don't wondering know. like so with these high performers and you're you're dividing performance brackets for that reward into thirds what, what does that do to the upper third? And then at the same time, we see a disproportionate number of SNPs dropping off due to past performance issues, right? So there's like of all the plans with past performance penalties, whether it was strike two or strike three, um, there's 16 were SNP versus eight mm -hmm. non-SNP. So like double are dropping off the end and they're wow. disproportionately making up the top. So that made me a little bit scared for what those you know, how that might play out in, in those HEI performance levels. I didn't even think about that. It's like new fear. Yeah, unlocked. Yeah, here's something else to, to be scared of. Thanks. Captain, no, it's, it's bad. Didn't do it. 